So we've seen that there are very good reasons why computers go wrong when they do mathematical calculations. But what else do computers do? I want to look now at one of the classic texts on computing, the 1950 paper by Alan Turing on machine intelligence, in which he proposed what we now call the Turing test. Turing argued that a sensible test of a computer's ability to display intelligent behavior is to ask whether it is capable of holding a conversation with us so that we could not tell whether we were chatting to a human being or to a computer. Here is a hypothetical conversation from Alan Turing's paper in 1950. No, it isn't. Sorry. Please write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge. Count me out on this one. I never could write poetry. Add 34,000. 957 to 70,764. 105,621. Do you play chess? Yes. I have king at my king one and no other pieces. You have only king at king six and rook at rook one. It is your move. What do you play? Rook to rule eight, mate. This is a remarkable hypothetical conversation to which we will return. Remember, Turing is writing long before today's computers existed, when computers were used for calculation, when input and output were through switches, lights, and teletype. When I was at school, my friends and I were fascinated by the idea of a computer playing chess. This was long before access to chess playing computers was commonplace. Chess seemed to us to be one of the greatest tests of the human intellect. Would a computer ever be able to beat a strong human chess player? In 1968, David Levy, who was a strong but not outstanding player, had made a bet with various computer scientists, eventually worth £1,250, that no computer would beat him within 10 years, and he won the wager. Chess is a difficult game for computer programmers. The number of possible moves is so great that calculating all possible moves far ahead requires an enormous amount of computer time. That's not the way humans play chess. Computers can be programmed to play other games, which are perhaps simpler. It is in backgammon that a computer first beat a human world champion. Hans Berliner's programme BKG 9.8 um, beat Luigi Villa in 1979. It was an interesting match. While the computer played well, experts thought Villa had played rather better, but the match was short enough for luck to be a significant factor. The decisive game hinged on a straight race in which Villa had a large advantage but the computer rolled 31 pips more than Villa over 12 turns, which is pretty good dice throwing, in order to reach a position where it had a 20% chance of winning. It then threw a double six to secure the win, so computers, like humans, can be lucky on occasion. But chess seems to be a game of pure skill that leaves no room for such luck, and it was not until 1997 that a computer beat the world champion in a chess match when the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov three and a half, two and a half. Deep Blue had enormous computing power, with 30 120 megahertz microprocessors working in parallel. It could evaluate 200 million positions in a second. So was it Deep Blue's sheer computational power which beat Kasparov? Well, a recent book by Nate Silver has given a rather interesting account of the match. In the first game, Kasparov had gained a winning advantage. Deep Blue, on his 44th move, had an opportunity to prolong the game, but instead played a rather poor move, which, eased, which made it easy for Kasparov to exploit his advantage. Kasparov was puzzled. How had such a powerful computer made such a mistake? Kasparov deduced that the computer 
must have been capable of looking so far ahead that he could see that the apparently better move would still lead to defeat, and therefore had chosen the other move as possibly making the game last longer. So Kasparov deduced that Deep Blue was searching potential positions much further ahead than he had previously imagined. In the next game, Deep Blue gains an advantage, and this time, on the 44th move, Kasparov checked, and Deep Blue had a choice of two king moves. He played the one which left his king more exposed. This seemed to offer Kasparov an opportunity to play to force a draw by perpetual check, and in fact, post-match analysis showed that he could have got a draw had he done so. But to the surprise of all spectators, Kasparov didn't play that way. In fact, he resigned the game. Why? Well, he thought he knew from the previous game that Deep Blue could calculate far enough ahead to see whether or not there was a perpetual check. Since Deep Blue had permitted that line, Kasparov deduced that he couldn't force a draw, and therefore that the game was lost, so he resigned in what was, in fact, a perfectly drawn position. The next three games were then drawn, with Kasparov thoroughly demoralised, and in the sixth and last game, Kasparov made an early blunder, and Deep Blue won the game and the match. So at last, our computer had beaten the world's top human chess player. So was this the ultimate triumph of machine intelligence? Well, if Nate Silver is right, the critical moment was Deep Blue's 44th move in the first game, when it played an apparently weaker move. Had Deep Blue, as Kasparov thought, looked so far ahead that it could see no difference between the outcome of the apparently better move and the one it chose? Well, no. There was a bug in Deep Blue's program. So it had played a poor move in error, in an already losing position. But by assuming this move was intentional, Kasparov overrated his machine opponent's ability to see ahead, and as a result, he threw away the second game and was so demoralised that he underperformed in the remaining games and lost the match. So in this reading, Deep Blue won, not through outstanding artificial intelligence, but because of a programming error and Kasparov's resulting misanalysis of Deep Blue's capability. And we said there was no luck in chess. <laughs>